All right. Uh, first of all, welcome everyone. Um, Assalamu alaikum, and it's a pleasure to have all of you here uh, this afternoon, especially on such a cold day. This seems to be the perfect place to be in warmth, friendship, and poetry, mm -hmm. uh, which seem to be uh, the great uh, catalysts of, of uh, fellowship and, and, uh, and coming together. Um, we're really pleased tonight on behalf of the Muslim Students Association, uh, here at Yale on behalf of Dwight Hall, um, and particularly the Muslim Leadership Lab program, which will be launching in, in January, and it's being incubated here uh, at Dwight Hall. Uh, and also, of course, our abiding friends and uh, colleagues at uh, the Muslim Life program at the Yale Chaplain's Office. We're really uh, pleased to welcome everyone tonight to, to this special gathering. Um, there's never a good time at Yale to do things, and um, because everything is always so busy and people are at a breakneck speed. So uh, thank you for, for being here tonight and being, being part of the, this gathering, and I hope friends will continue to join us and, uh, over, the, over the course of the next uh, hour and a half or so. Uh, my name is uh, Abdurrahman Malik. I know many of you in the room, I have the privilege of knowing many of you in the room. I'm a postgraduate associate at the Council on Middle East Studies, was a Yale World Fellow last year. Um, but it says I'm, I'm associated with Dwight Hall and, uh, and the director of the Muslim Leadership Lab uh, program, like I said, which will be launching in, in January. Uh, as part of um, my work here at Dwight has been really over the last sort of um, year and in preparation for the 2018-2019 school year, thinking about individuals, personalities, perspectives that we can bring into the Yale community that um, perhaps aren't heard uh, as often as they should, but certainly that will add value to the experience, uh, our experience here at, here at Yale. And we were really privileged uh, two weeks ago to have Mark Gonzalez uh, with us in this very room, in fact, um, and at the Sci Center for Innovative Thinking. And I'm equally pleased uh, that uh, Baraka Blue has been able to join us, uh, really wedged between a very busy schedule leading up to arriving in New Haven yesterday and a very busy schedule that will begin tomorrow morning as he departs New Haven. So first of all, thank you so much for being being with us. Last night we had a lovely gathering um, in the Muslim prayer space over at uh, near the chaplain's office. And, and the topic today um, really came out of a meditation on uh, Leonard Cohen's famous poem where he talks about, you know, the cracks and that, you know, all of our life there's this sensibility that we go searching for perfection and wholeness. Um, but then the question that the poet, in this case Leonard Cohen asks us, is uh, if there's no cracks, then how does the light get in? If we're already so perfect, why is there need for meditation and spiritual understanding? And we had been thinking a lot about it, and Baraka and I have been talking about this for years, is that what does poetry mean for us as, as moderns, as people? In, in this age, we often look to Rumi and to Hafiz and the, the poets of the mystical past, in particular in the Islamic tradition, but also the poets in the mystical path of in the Christian, Jewish, Buddhist tradition, or even in the transcendental tradition of New England in the 1800s. You know, these were poets who were searching for answers and for, for meaning. And, and I wonder in 2018, um, in an era of uh, MAGA and Brexit, in an era of fractious politics and fractious societies, in an era of Me Too, and an era of fight for gender justice, and in an era of um, racialized posters going up on campus almost on a weekly basis, you kind of wonder, what does poetry have to say to this situation that we're in? Are, is poetry just sweet words um, that uh, maybe put a bomb on the situation, but don't really, don't really address it? And in a way, um, that's where this idea of poems for the brokenhearted and the search for a modern Rumi came. And I, don't, I know very few people who can address this, not only based on their craft, but based on a life experience like Baraka Blue can. Originally from Seattle, Washington, um, Baraka Blue studied Islamic studies uh, as part of his undergraduate. But I, I, would, I would be so bold as to say his real education has come um, on the path. Uh, he is an uh, itinerant traveler, uh, almost a person with no fixed address in the best possible way. 
uh, because uh, I've always found that wherever he is, he's present. Mm -hmm. And our paths have uh, ended up crossing in all kinds of unusual, interesting um, places over the years, whether that's in Singapore, Indonesia, or, or London. And um, I've uh, grown to not only know and love Barca's work and him, uh, but I've also seen his vision of poetry as a source of healing and transformation uh, grow. He's currently set up, um, let me get it right, the Rumi Center, Center for Spiritual Spirituality and the, arts. and the Arts, which is an online space where literally people from all over the world are engaging with one another in uh, essentially what is, what is a global writing workshop on addressing ideas of spirituality and modernity uh, head on. And I think that is like terribly uh, exciting. Uh, that's uh, that's really powerful stuff, and I hope he'll talk about that tonight. Um, so, without any further ado, first of all, welcome, Mark And uh, we're gonna we're gonna kind of run this conversation. We'll start off, we'll chat a little bit, um, and uh, hear hopefully lots of wonderful poetry. And then uh, this circle is a circle of conversation. Not a circle of questions and answers. Mm -hmm. God knows we probably, mm -hmm. and I need more answers mm -hmm. than I need to ask questions, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, Baraka, let me, let me start, start off by saying that one of the things that's been really interesting about your work from the very beginning has been this amazing reference to the past. But I've never found that you're stuck there. Mm -hmm. Like, I, you know, you, you, ever since I met you, you've referenced Rumi. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear about your relationship with the poet Rumi and, and what that's meant for you. Mm -hmm. But I've never felt like you fetishized Rumi. Mm -hmm. I think there is a sense that we fetishize the past to the point that it becomes almost, um, it becomes almost iconic and unreal and uh, inaccessible to us. Mm -hmm. But in a way, in your work, I've always found that the references to the past are, are almost, um, uh, are almost uh, like in, unusually accessible. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I wonder if you can maybe start us there. Um, with your relationship with Rumi and what's that meant to your to your work and your your Masha. craft. Thank you, Abdurrahman. We're honored to be with you in another continent. Um, and now in your home country. Home home. And thank you all of you for being here for honoring us. Um, the most valuable thing we can give anyone is our time, our breaths, mm -hmm. invaluable jewel of. of because if you were to give me diamonds or ju and jewels and things, I would accept very gladly. But, <laughs> but you could always work and buy more things. But once we exhale that breath, it's gone. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I really want to start by thanking you for honoring us with this precious jewel. And inshallah, we're honoring each other's time. The thing that you said about the past made me remember, and I had to, I just wrote this a few days ago. Basho, the, the Japanese haiku poet, he has this line where he says, learn about pines from the pine and bamboo from the bamboo. Learn about pines from the pine and bamboo from the bamboo. Don't follow in the footsteps of the old poets. Seek what they sought. And then he says, po the secret of poetry lies in treading the middle path between the reality and the vacuity of the world. Mm -hmm. The reality and the vacuity. And there's a lot that could be said about that. But one thing that strikes me about, there's kind of two paths within the spiritual path that you find within Sufism. One emphasizes that the world is all illusion, because God is all there really is. But this other strain, which is almost the opposite, says that the whole world is this theophany, this divine unfolding, and it's all pointing to God, it's all divine communication. And to the first <laughs> viewpoint, the proper response is asceticism. Praying, fasting, staying away from the temptation of the world. But to the second one, it's falling in love with everything and being a lover, while not losing sight that there is something which transcends the realm of forms. And Rumi emphasizes the second path. And 
for me, what drew me to his poetry is that it's not just that he's good with words, but it's that he's experiencing something and the words happen to overflow from that experience. And so a lot of my journey has been to seek what, seek what he sought, not just to follow in the footsteps, but to try to taste what he's tasting, to use the Sufi analogy, to have experiential knowledge. And so uh, that's just a few remarks on that. But Rumi had an interesting path himself, didn't he? I think, I think, in a way, because he's become such a popular poet in America through translation, I, I think sometimes, I don't know if you feel the same way, I sometimes feel that Rumi, sometimes his words become cliche. Yes. You know, the um, easily Instagrammable mm -hmm. quotes, mm -hmm. which throughout the day give us a little bit of hope in the darkness of the universe. And we're like, yo, Rumi, you just said it. <laughs> and then we kind of move on from it. Mm -hmm. and, and I sometimes feel that it obscures certain salient features of Rumi's own biography. Rumi is a refugee. His family flee is fleeing Mongol invasion from modern day Afghanistan. Uh, the streets of wherever the Mongol armies are going are filled with blood and death. And that's what Rumi is running from. They're, they leave everything, his father leaves everything, the whole family has to traverse all the way from Afghanistan into inner center of Anatolia to the great city of Konya, um, uh, where they eventually find themselves. He is, an, he is a person who is living amongst people who speak Anatolia and Turkish, and yet most of his poetry is in Farsi, a language that is a foreign language. Mm -hmm. You're like writing in Farsi and New Haven. Mm -hmm. um, and not only that, he suffers sort of the loss of homeland and a recalibration of his identity. But on top of that, the person who he loves the most in the world is taken away from him. Yeah. I mean, this is a tragic story. Yeah. Uh, this is not the story of uh, a Hallmark greeting card. Mm -hmm. How do you yeah. think, so how does that experience sort of change the way that we, you, look at Rumi? What then, I would say, does his po poems mean and his poetry yeah. mean for, for those who've had similar experiences? Yeah, that's beautiful. And it's true. I mean, right, we associate Rumi with love and wine and, right, you know, like you say, Hallmark greeting card. But he lived a very difficult life. And in fact, one detail is that, I mean, it's, there's different historical narratives. It's a bit hard to uncover, but his master, Shams, the earliest sources relate that he was murdered and that he was murdered by Rumi's own disciples led by one of Rumi's sons. Mm -hmm. So imagine your son mm -hmm. and your disciples killing your spiritual guy. I mean, what? This is intense. Um, there's so much that can be said and some of these lines which Interesting enough, and Leonard Cohen, I mean, I, I think he must have got it from Rumi, mm -hmm. because he has that line about the, the cracks or the pla place where the light gets yeah. in, and Rumi has a line that says, the wound is the place where the light enters. He must have, it I think he must have read it. Oh, I, I have no doubt. And Rumi also says similar things in other words, such as, if the stone is irritated with every rub, how will that ever become polished? Mm -hmm. And he also has lines about, all this is profound symbolism, like within the Sufi tradition too, but he has ideas uh, that he talks about for his disciples he's pouring the wine, which means the expansive spiritual states of drawing near to the divine, but he said, but as for me, I'm drinking the dregs, the bitter stuff at the bottom of the barrel. Mm -hmm which in the Sufi path, there's hubbed and bust, which is like you have expansive states where you feel one with the all, mm -hmm. and then you have states of separation, which the, 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 the more advanced you get on the path, the more intense each one is. You can imagine if you're in this self 
listness, where the illusion, the, the, the boundaries between yourself and the ultimate reality uh, uh, dissolve, then to lose that and be back, that how, so he's talking about being in that state of separation while guiding others to union, to, to union. And, but he's saying that if this is what my beloved, the divine beloved desires to pour me, then I love to drink it, the bitter stuff. So he has a very different relationship to suffering than I think most modern people. He so much has such a profound, not belief in God, but experience of God, that he experiences the pain of existence as if it's from God, then I love it. And like, he always talks about Layla Mejnoon. Who knows the story of Mejnoon Layla, right? Many people will know this is a famous story. So it's like the Muslim Romeo and Juliet, you could say. <laughs> so the story is that there was a, a, a man and a woman, young boy and girl, really, who fall in love. Qais and, and Layla. But of course, Layla, uh, like any good love story, they can't be together. Uh, what kind of love story would it be if it was easy, right? So... Her parents refuse to allow them to get married. They marry her off to someone else. And so, Qais is broken hearted and he's so in love with her that he goes insane, essentially. He's wandering the desert and he's saying all type of, he's following a black dog and they're saying, what are you doing? And he's saying, this black dog reminds me of the color of Layla's hair. And then he's kissing a wall over and over again and they're like, what are you doing? You're an insane person. And he's saying, I once saw Layla walk by this wall and, and her shoulder brushed this wall. So, you know, and so he acquires the name Majnun, which means insane person. Someone who's actually been jinn, as a jinn, Majnun. But one of the great stories of Majnun that I really love and that illustrates this is that one day Layla's family threw a banquet and invited everyone in the village and Majnun, of course, comes. And Layla is serving the guests. So he's waiting in line with his plate. And he's so excited. And each step closer to Layla, he gets more excited. He can barely control himself. And then when he gets to Layla, he gives her his plate. And she takes it and she throws it against the wall and it shatters in a thousand pieces. And everyone's looking, right? The whole party stops, right? You know, like when the, in that when the record skips, like, sure, right, in the movie. Like, and he, but he becomes more overjoyed. He becomes almost ecstatic. And they're like, you really are crazy. Like, she just rejected you in the most terrible way. What's wrong with you? And he says, don't you see? Now I get to get back in line. <laughs> He doesn't care about the feast that everyone else cares about. He cares about Layla. And that is what Rumi is really talking about. The other things that people want in this world, success and pleasure, and even that, it's all fleeting. I want what the Divine Beloved wants for me, even if that means he shatters my plate into a million pieces. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the love of, of Rumi. And is that when these things, when his very teacher is taken from him, when his own son betrays him, when his family is forced to flee, he sees this whole world as a, a type of divine play where his beloved is unfolding a, a beautiful story. And he sees, because we know if at the end of, that's the thing. So every movie that's a great love story, it's, it follows the same thing, right? They fall in love, but then there is a barrier. If there's no barrier, it's not a good story. So we have to have the barriers to love. Mm -hmm. But we watch love stories and know we're sad when they can't be together, or we're, you know, whether it's Romeo and Juliet, etc., etc. We know in the back of our mind, well, not Romeo and Juliet, that's a, even that's a, that's a bad example. But in, okay, Hollywood ones, most of them, we know they're going to be together in the end, right? And so we endure this pain of separation because we know it ends in union. And in fact, it's a better story 
the more difficult the separation is because it ends in union. And so Rumi has this certainty that I think is almost unimaginable to a lot of modern people, that this is a beautiful story and it ends well. And so whatever happens in it, it just makes it a better story. I don't know, how do you tackle this question of, of love and the title of brokenness in your poetry? There's something I, 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 I always start your poetry off with some sharing about this. If I may. Yeah. Because none of this is planned. Sure. <laughs> none of this conversation was planned, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> this is all unfolding in the moment. Yeah. Um, Rumi also has a line about love that's really beautiful. It's a great metaphor. Because for him, everything that we love is actually loving God. And it's really profound, actually. His concept of God is so far beyond what most people think of that. Because he says, he gives this analogy of a, a warrior. He says, a warrior gives his son a wooden sword to prepare him for battle. So the son is playing with this wooden sword. And he, you know, and he says, at some point, the wooden sword breaks. And the boy is, 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 is heartbroken. His sword is broken, so he runs to his father, and he's so upset. But his father knows that, like, no, that's the whole point of a wooden sword. You play with it until it breaks, and then, then, then you get ready for a real sword. This is just a trial. This is a test. This is a preparation. And Rumi says, so count it a, a blessing when loss comes your way in the lane of love. When the test comes to an end, you will love the all-merciful. So he considers heartbreak as a preparation for this higher love. And I'll, just to like fill it out, because there's a lot of, if you're not coming from that kind of classical Sufi tradition, it might be hard to understand. So they have this idea of real love, ish haqiqi, and ish majazi. So there's metaphorical love and real love. And for Rumi and these, this, this tradition, everything that you love other than God is actually metaphorical love. What you really love is God. Because God is beauty. al -Jamal. And so if you love the beauty of a flower, or the beauty of a sunset or a face, you're actually loving a manifestation of the divine reality, even a drop of the ocean of that, in that mirror of that created thing. And if you love... Justice. You're loving Al-Adl, also one of the 99 names of God, manifested in an individual or in a, a just person. If you love gentleness, it's Al-Latif, another one of the... You're, it's, everyone, and he, he, Rumi says, if the veil were lifted, you would see that the beloved is always God. Mm. And so if you have your heart broken by the world or by a person... Rumi, from his from the perspective he's looking at, this is a great thing. Because now you have to search for a higher beloved. Right? I love not that which sets, as Abraham says in the Quranic narrative. Right? That which is eternal. So, um, and there's a great Sufi story that a, a young novice went to a Sufi sheikh and said, uh, Sheikh, I want to take the path. And he said, son, have you ever been he said, no, I'm the young man. He said, go fall in love and then come back to me. Because there's nothing this path can give you until you've been in love. So I think that's really an importance of Rumi for our time, really, because that message is so profound. And it's a spirituality that's, that's, that's love-based. And we see so much other than that passing for religion or passing for other things these days. Um, and I try to have my art reflect that as well. And I try to have my own path. I mean, it's not always, e it's, it's, not, it's easy to be patient and grateful when things are going wonderful. It's difficult when, to be present with the test. I'd be taking. So, let's hear some of the poetry. This one, so, I'll read a, a newer one, inshallah, I remember. 
There was a station called Patience, I should say, before we start this. Patience, as Sabu, is one of the 99 names of God. And within the path, they talk about, we try to clothe ourselves with these divine names, to take on the mercy, mm -hmm. to take on the justice. And the last one always listed in the divine divine names is Patience. God is Patience, the Patient, as Sabu. And they say that this is the hardest one to acquire. So this poem is about this. There was a station called Patience that few had attained. Most got off before that stop and only knew it in name. Those who basked in the sun but didn't care for the rain were perplexed at those few who remained on the train. Paid them no mind and were blind to the secrets they knew, like the brightest colors hide and the deepest of blue. For opposite the direction most people pursue, there is a station called Patience, only known by a few. It may not have the bright lights or the games that amuse, but its beauty exceeds everything that they knew. The other stations always look shiny and new, but this station looks simple and hidden from view. Those who found Patience seem to find it by chance. Perhaps they fell asleep on the train and woke up in its trance. Maybe a dream they had seen where the question was asked, is there more to this place than appears at first glance? Some were forced there when the cost of living was high, or the struggles and the troubles that chased them inside. But those who entered her tavern and drank from her wine found the place they called Patience is a station divine. For what looked to be ruins to the ones that passed by as they scoffed or they pitied those living inside. Patience people looked back and they pitied their pride which veiled them from what only patience could reveal or could hide. Patience is a trust the other stations refuse. It infuses and transforms mortal vision anew. Patience is not merely waiting, though they're often confused. Patience is a station you awaken into. Once you find the one for whom patience is due, you'll see a mysterious relation between patience and you. Like a long lost memory that finally came into view, you'll see that patience has been patiently waiting. That's very powerful. Mm. It's interesting, the, this idea of the station, because it, mm -hmm. it's like a journey, mm -hmm. it's like a place that you get to. Mm -hmm. And um, earlier today, we were at uh, Hopkins School um, talking to students and having a conversation with students. And it was interesting because you, you um, recited a poem. Uh, recited a poem there on this notion of progress mm -hmm. and it's the paradox of progress mm -hmm. and evolution mm -hmm. and you, you mentioned a, a statement by the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you said uh, yeah, about, about guidance and misguidance. Right. So it was our, something about our technological power has outstripped our moral or spiritual power. We have guided missiles and misguided men. Mm -hmm. Something to that effect. And I, and I just, I, I see kind of a line between that and the poem that you just recited. Because yeah. there's this amazing moment in that poem where you, where you speak about sometimes you arrive at patience because you lose everything. Yeah. And it's so interesting, this, this relationship between loss and gain. And how, I think within, particularly within a spiritual framing, sometimes those things take on a sensibility that we as moderns, in a way, struggle with. Yes. But I think that also has to do with, with, with the way in which you see the past, mm -hmm. and how the past informs the, the present. And maybe before you recite that poem, because I'd love for you to share it with, with us mm -hmm. here, maybe explain it a little bit, because it certainly caught the attention of some of the young students today. Right. I think we're sort of taken with some of the imagery of that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I think each era has its unquestioned assumptions about itself. And it's hard, you know, like they say, a fish doesn't know that there's such thing as water. Because mm -hmm. if, if you don't know anything, mm -hmm. things are known by their opposites. And so if you jump out of the water, that's the fish that's like, wait, what? I'm in the... And then it comes back <laughs> down. Whoa, we're in something that's different than up, you know? And then he's like, Plato's cave. He's been out of the cave. He's telling, trying to tell his fellow fish, like, we're in water. What are you even talking about? <laughs> and I think those of us who have been exposed, I mean, to a certain extent with study you can, but even if you've visited some kind of pre-modern peoples where you see traditional life in action, you see very quickly that there's certain things that they have that we've lost. Okay, we have better healthcare, we have better technology, but there are certain very important things that we've lost. And I mean, we all notice this. I mean, look at the... Uh, mental health crisis, the opioids, the suicides, the... We live in a society of opulence, but yet profound uh, malcontent from, from a wide swath of people. Mm -hmm. And so we have to ask why. And I think that uh, we... I, really, that, that poem is just about being humble vis-a-vis -vis the past. Because the unquestioned assumption of our time is like we're progressing, we're moving forward, we're evolving, we're getting better every day. But that's a weird dogma. Because yes, certain things get better, but certain things don't. And like, it's not like it's this linear progression. It seems like a strange, unquestioned assumption to have. Especially because we're not sure where we're going to go. The word progress implies that there is an intended goal. But yet, that's never stated either. Like, where are we going here? So, in any case, I think a lot of this comes back to an, in, an interior quality that the contemplative path can give one. And I think it's funny that if you go to like the Himalayas, you go to Tibet and these play, places, the Buddhist monks and, that spent so much time in seclusion and contemplation they never attempted to summit the, the mountain exterior in, in the outer realm, but yet all these Westerners people, right, climb the Mount K2, and right, this. But yet they just, they sat in their seclusion because they were summiting the inner mountain. Mm -hmm. And I think so much of our power is focused exterior, mm -hmm. but yet that we're, we, have, we don't really know ourselves. We're actually very on the surface of our being and potential, and so, Actually, that reminds me of another poem that's new. It's not the one you mentioned, but if I could. So it's very short, but it's inspired by two women who are uh, two of my great inspirations. The first one is Rabbi al Adawiyah, who is a great uh, saint, of the great, great Sufi saint. And she was known to be a person of profound spirituality, but she spent most of her time in seclusion. And there's all these wonderful stories, like people would come to her door and say, Rabia, come outside, it's beautiful. And she would say, there's nothing in the world that's not already here with me. There's no and she has profound statements. She's really one of the kind of figureheads of this path of love. Because she, she had this profound prayer that she said, oh God, if I worship you for fear of hell, then throw me in hell. And if I worship you for desire for paradise, then bar its gates from me. But if I worship you for you alone, then unveil yourself to me. So she really emphasized this this beautiful, profound relationship with God, but she, she was someone who had this profound interior quality. And another person who's an inspiration of mine, and Rabbi was a poet as well, but the, the other person who inspires me is Emily Dickinson, who was a great American poet and was also someone of a profound interior um, life. And she was actually a closet poet. A lot of people don't know this, but she was literally a closet poet because her own family didn't know she was a poet. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's considered arguably the greatest poet of her age in the English language, but even the people that lived with her didn't know she wrote poems. And when she died, they found a closet full of poems. And they were mm -hmm. like... And 
that's really profound to me because I think our age is so, right, external. Posting on social media, advertising, market yourself, and personal websites, and hashtag me, and the whole thing, selfie. And I think, um, and in this time, we need to really think about interiority. So this poem is called She Wrote Poems in Secret. She wrote poems in secret. She wrote secrets in her poems and said she only felt communion when sitting silent all alone. She appeared odd and quiet, but was polite just the same. She wore the clothes of the simple and her room was small and plain. But within it was a window that looked out upon the sea, the firmament beyond it, and the fire underneath. Those who ventured in her chamber said no such window they could find. She'd just look at them with sadness and say, this window's in the mind. They'd say, come outside, it's springtime. There's a world out here to see. She'd say, there's nothing in the cosmos that's not already here with me. They'd say she's gone agoraphobic. By depression, she's been had. Anxiety has gripped her, or fever's made her mad. But the poems that she wrote, they were of sweet September rain, love's enduring flowers, gardens green that never fade. How truth itself and beauty become one beneath the grave and really always have been, though a tongue can scarce explain. She wrote poems in secret. She wrote secrets in her poems. And though no one could match her, she died humble and unknown. Yeah, so the opposite of evolution piece is really just to get to people think think about the unquestioned assumptions of our age, that we're evolving, we're getting better, we're like, and there are, it's a great time to be alive, but also we should just be humble. That's the whole point. It's an old piece, I wrote it when I was quite young, but I'm excited to I believe in the opposite of evolution. We all want spoken poems. The heartbeat was the drumbeat. Most have lost the essence in the form. The bumbling caveman we imagine, it's us in fact, in truth. Things are flowing down, not upward. The waterfall is proof. When spirit danced on tooth and lip and hearts were carved with tongue, when nature was revelation, but now what will we tell our young? I believe this moment here and now was written before the stars. Each word red in color like dust storm clouds on Mars, no black and white. Salmon swimming upstream home like Adam since the fall. The voice was never silent. The question is who will heed the call? Perhaps Darwin's dreams were misinterpreted. He thought that science was a lie. He didn't ask the ones who'd mastered, thought who'd better know than I. The bumbling caveman we imagine, it's us, in fact, in truth. Things are flowing down, not upward. The waterfall is proof. When spirit danced on tooth and lip and hearts were carved with tongue, when nature was revelation, but now what will we tell our young? And I don't believe that the ends necessarily justify the means. Because for the one outside of time, there is no end or in between. So if you lean much closer, I'll share a secret I was told. Okay. Hell is not just burning fire. It is also freezing cold. Contemplate the range of temperatures in our galaxy alone. By what we can bear within that scale, our fragility is shown. But a fraction. Arrogance from this point of view is such an odd reaction. Yet so many claim to know it all, so many sects and factions. Who will come down from themselves and truly prostrate only once? 
But it's hard to see through the dancing girls, flowing liquor, clouds of blunts, media smoke screens, and million dollar marketing campaigns. See many of who they are as they were molded for someone else's gain. I seek refuge in thee, who caused the day to break, and pray that all our eyes will finally see just what's at stake. If it is evolution, then tell me what it's for. Atom bombs, striped toothpaste, and trillion dollar war. Is this the peak of all that's come a billion years before, or is this simply the furthest away we have yet drifted? Because uh, today we had, um, there was one student at, at Hopkins School who I think was really taken by this poem. And clearly he'd been thinking a lot about this question of, of now, of modernity, I think, in a, in a way. Mm -hmm. And um, there's something that really resonated with him. But also I could sense that made him uh, a little bit shaky. Mm. Because I, I think this is, the, this is, in a way, in a way, our dilemma, you know? I think as much as um, we want to find the answers to why, we also live in uh, a time when there's sort of profound unease around belief. Mm, yes. And there's profound unease around, uh, unease around the notion of a believer. Sure. And I think, I think we're not inured to that here at Yale, sure. where, where I think so much of, for, for those of us in the room who might consider themselves believers, those of us who don't, um, either way, you, you know, there's a, there's a tension. And I, and I wonder, maybe this is a question that's unfair. Mm -hmm. um, in your work, which is so deeply rooted in uh, spirituality, and actually borrows and is fed by so many different spiritual traditions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. including the one that is your, your own. How do you think your poetry speaks to the modern agnostic or the one who struggles with belief? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can it? Does it? If it does, how does it? How, do, how, how does it do? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, uh, I feel like when people say I don't believe in God, my response is I don't believe in the God you don't believe in too. <laughs> you know? Um, and the only way that, and I understand why people reject uh, religion and faith because what passes for it a lot of times is pretty something I reject too. And the only thing that that really spoke to me was the mystical traditions and the contemplative paths. That there's a, a door inside of us to something beyond us. And I think that that's something that most people intuit, even if it's, you know, I mean, you know, for, for, for God's sakes, Sam Harris has a, a spirituality podcast and a, and a meditation app you know yeah. even the, the kind of new, new atheists into it that there's a way to a deeper state of mind and awareness so I often try to present it in a universal enough way that it speaks to that desire for stillness and for tranquil tranquility and peace but also I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything and so I think for me, um, I'm just speaking what, where my like intuition and my experiences lead me. And if that doesn't relate to you, then that doesn't relate to you. Um, but I will say this: what is what really speaks to me about Rumi, and because when I was younger, I was I, I always just had the kind of soul of a seeker. But I was trying to work it all out as far as like how does. Okay, 
can it be that just one religion is true? Are they all true? If they're all true, how are they all true? And what are they all true in a perennialist sense like Huxley, where it's just a deeper symbolic word? Or is it true in the more, you know, Martin Ling's side of say Nasser, where each form is necessary, you can't mix? I was really on the intellectual level grappling with all this. But the, what, what happened to me, especially why I keep going back to Rumi, is because he keeps saying, like, that will never lead you to God. All that will never lead you. It's only the heart. It's only the heart. And he says, you know, while the intellect is, is preparing its camel bags to go on that pilgrimage, love has already circled the Kaaba seven times. You know? And he really just emphasizes love. Lo loving people, and he's, he was a great scholar of Sharia, that's what people forget, he was a Hanafi Hafi, and so he knew that world very well, but at some point, he just was like, that's not the way to God, that's not the way in. And he, you know, he has these beautiful lines, and he went to the theologians, or, you know, you just take it as people debating about God, and he said, they were talking about my beloved, but that's not how a lover talks about their beloved. They were saying, the, the beloved's eyes are this many centimeters apart. And the beloved, like, that's not how a lover talks. The beloved, the lover says, my beloved's eyes are like two full moons. Her lips are like a rose garden, you know. So he's just emphasizing fall in love. Like, the, this thing is so limited, but this thing is, has infinite potential. So that's really what I'm interested in. And poetry has a way to to bypass, you know, David White, contemporary American poet, he says poetry is language uh, at which we have no defenses. It, it bypasses the fortress of the mind and it hits us. And the thing about poetry is that it's language that what is said is inseparable from how it's said. Because in other forms of communication, if I say, uh, here, take the brown hat. If you understand every word in that sentence, it's effective communication. Mm -hmm. But if I recite a poem, and you understand every word, but it doesn't hit you, <coughs> then that communication has failed. Mm -hmm. Not 50% or 75%, but 100%. And in that sense, it's like a joke, because mm -hmm. I like comedy, the art form of stand-up comedy. I cannot do it, but I appreciate <laughs> it. Because it's so, it's such a, it's kin to poetry because it's just you and a microphone in the crowd and you're trying to elicit a reaction with nothing but what you're saying. But stand-up comedy is so much harder because a poem, it, you know, there's a certain level to people, people can feel it to varying extents. Oh, yeah. oh, you know, whatever. And people are going to be polite usually. But a joke, you either win all the way or lose all the way. They either laugh or they don't. There's no like... And, you know, we've all been in a situation where someone tells a joke and everyone laughs and you're like, wait, I don't get it. And they try to explain it to you. And it's just like, never mind. <laughs> because what is said is inseparable from how it's said. And there's something about that. Um, you know, I have a, I believe that there's some quality in us that is profoundly interconnected. And that there's a place in me. If I go deep enough, it's also in you. I can't explain it. I can't logically defend that but I know it's true, and I'm not interested in convincing anybody of it, but I think art is, is the way that we intuit this, and we experience someone's internal world, you know, it's like the soul made visible, you know, so. If so to ask you to recite a poem for a skeptic uh -huh. from, your, from your work, what would you present? So this, you know this term in Greek, uh, apophasis, which is this idea that it's almost like, you know, the Taoist, every tradition has a different way to say this, but like the Tao that can be spoken is not the Tao. It's this idea that a language always falls short of true experience. The Sufis say like, uh, the taste of the word honey is not the taste of honey. There's a big difference. So how can you explain honey to one who's never tasted? And Apophasis' is the idea of you make a statement about the ultimate reality, but then you counter it 
you, you know, you go against it. It's not, it is not this, but even by saying it is not this, you give the conception of this and then, then you deconstruct it and it kind of like creates a mystical like break, like, cause you can't grab, it's too slippery. Mm -hmm. That's this idea. So this poem, uh, it's called Beyond. Beyond stars, beyond ours, beyond planets and spheres, beyond quarks and quasars, beyond far, beyond near, beyond space, beyond time, beyond nations and climes, beyond what we beyond, beyond beings and signs. Beyond letters, beyond words, beyond spoken and heard. Beyond everything that will and will never occur. Beyond every number and shape you could ever conjure. Beyond, 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 ad infinitum absurd. Beyond present, beyond presence, beyond the center and edges, beyond measure, Beyond treasure, beyond breath and the essence. Beyond less than is more and more or less in the lessons of every messenger sent and every saint that ascended. The seven heavens and escape the veil of self in the presence and rent the illusion asunder in a thunder of blessings. For the lovers, the ascetics, and the mystical brethren dip forever reverently in the rivers of heaven, beyond all that, and all a pen could etch on the dead skin, beyond all recollection, every answer and question, every medicine, every poison, every tool, every weapon, beyond every poor fool who ever tried to express him, beyond a him or her, with all these feeble expressions, and all tongues prostrate for God's sake and direction, Beyond the veils that separate from beyond what is destined be, and we were yonder realm that we already met in. All praise to the beyond what they ascribe and profess, and associate and describe and debate in their lessons. So beyond that it is nearer than the vein in your neck, and the thought to your mind, and the mirror to the reflection. So let us pause here for reflection. For that is the secret that gives perception to the blind and gives the intellect to fall prostrate by design. For when you reach the furthest reaches of beyond, it appears that the only thing beyond this beyond is the near. Is the near. For mm -hmm. We're going to open up the floor and, and, uh, in just a second and forward to questions, comments, concerns, mm -hmm. reflections. Um, do we need a modern Rumi? I think we need many modern Rumi's. Mm -hmm. What Rumi, Rumi believes that there are in his understanding, there are what he calls insanity canon. You find this perfected human beings, and what that means is people who have attained to their true nature, their fifth or their primordial nature. This idea that at the center of our being is a profound reality. You think yourself just a drop in the ocean, but you are also the entire ocean in a drop. He said that we have the Potential. And he describes the insano kama, the perfected human beings, as reed flutes, perfectly empty so that the divine breath can blow through them, perfectly selfless. And he says, these are the prophets and their true inheritors. And he says, hold fast to these people. And this is why all his poetry is about Shams, his, his master, because in him he's able to contemplate the highest realities because he sees them as a mirror perfectly reflecting these qualities. And I think modern people don't believe in those type of people anymore, or they say maybe once upon a time. Mm -hmm. But we don't have many examples of that, do we? But there are people that are truly 
selfless, that don't have any skin in the game. There's no ego involved at all. And even when you meet people that have attained some of that, who have really be transformed individuals, uh, that's what Rumi's really talking about. And Rumi emphasizes that it's your personal relationship with the Creator, and he's really dismissive of formalistic piety. And you see what I'm saying? Like, mm. Because it's the ego always attaching. So he's always like, every level there's another devil. The ego always tries to take truth and wisdom and fortify itself with it as opposed to be transformed by it. Mm. So I think we need people that are completely void of judgment of others and only see beauty and goodness and truly call people to their highest nature, their full potential. And what that might look like in 21st century America is very interesting, but it is also interesting to think that the number one selling poet or amongst the most selling poets for the last decade and a half in America has been this Afghani uh, scholar of Sharia law who lived 800 years ago. So there's something in him which transcends all of that. And so in some sense, he's the most universal, arguably the most universal uh, thinker in Islam. I think that it bears that out, I mean, just by his success. And um, I think, yeah, we need that right now. Mm. Oh, lots, lots to come back to. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to oh, 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 open the floor. And, um, all right, uh, Samson, go ahead. Um, so, thank you so much for an incredible talk. This is going back to a point, kind of on your last point, and also a question that I asked yesterday after your talk. Um, it seems that the Rumi that is being sold in these Barnes and Nobles and the Rumi that are being sold on making like the top charts yeah. is not the Rumi that you've come to know or the Rumi that we've come to know in our own tradition. And I guess um, this dichotomy between what is a Western Rumi with lines blacked out mm -hmm. versus what is the Rumi that wrote in the original in, in Farsi or like wrote about this mystic path towards Allah. Like how do we... I guess, as 21st century Muslims who are trying to go down this path of yeah. just all and looking at Rumi as a teacher, how do we know um, how to differentiate, but also to reconcile those two differences? That's great. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is that, like I say, if you don't tell your story, someone else will tell it for you. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think we should take it as a, a positive challenge, like mm -hmm. what we have. Because, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, for the Muslims in the room, I think we can relate to this. If someone, you know, average uh, person goes to a bookstore and finds a Rumi book and finds all this love and profound meaning and emphasis on selflessness and community and all this wisdom, and then goes to your average mosque looking for that, they might mm -hmm. not find that energy, that vibe, shall we say. So we need to create spaces that reflect the reality of Hashtag real talk. Hashtag real talk. <laughs> you know, so I, I know a lot of people are really critical of Coleman Barks and others who are the popular. And there's no doubt that Coleman Barks' translations of Rumi are, give or take, 50% Rumi, 50% Coleman Barks. You know, and he does make choices to downplay the Islamic elements. Choices that are, you know, for a Western audience who doesn't have those Islamic references. So he can defend, he, you know, for instance, there's a thousand ways to kneel down and kiss the ground. He that's what uh, Coleman Barks, you find that. It's a beautiful, you find it on Hallmark cards and on Facebook statuses. And but what the line is, is there's a, there's a thousand ways to make sajda, to prostrate, which is a specifically, the, the for those that don't know, most of you do, the emotion in prayer when you put your head on the ground. And so what Rumi is saying is that it's not just all about praying all the time, it's that we should constantly be in a state of prayer. When I give my brother a smile, this is my prostration to God. When I do a selfless act, this, we should be in prostration. Our hearts should be prostrated. It's a profound metaphysical statement. 
So the, the translation isn't wrong, but you're right. There is, it's not the whole story. It's, mm -hmm. And so at the same time, though, and I liken it to a good analogy that we can talk about is, is yoga, right? Every corner there's a yoga, and, and everyone, you know, get, people go there, most people, right, to get a toned physique or whatever, or you find some peace afterwards, you find more, you find, feel good. And, you know, for people that are really steeped in Hinduism and the eight limbs and the path and the, you know, the whole thing, everything, it's like, but, however, how many people started off going to yoga because they wanted a toned physique? Then they started to read a little more. They saw a picture of a guru on the wall. They picked up a book, and then they, they deepened them into the path. And so I think, how many people pick up a roomy book, and at first they're just like, oh, the beloved in wine, while they're drinking their wine with their girlfriend or boyfriend, and this is it, you know? But then let's go. People do take it deeper. So I actually look at people like Coleman Barks with profound gratitude because. He made pe people see beauty in Islam, and very unfortunately, a lot of <laughs> us aren't doing that. But that, but I also see as you know, he's very aged in years, and so our generation, it's our, we have to fill the gap now. We have to, but he's done profound work, and in fact, before him, and it's stages, right? Because Nicholson was the first one to translate Rumi, and has very academic translations, and they're very dry and boring, but they're very accurate. 100% accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they're very accurate. Let's put that 100%. Is, is something else. But, but they're boring. But they're good for studying the meaning. And people, you know, it's a mixed bag because Nicholson refused to go to the Muslim world because he didn't want his scholarship to be corrupted. He, he really just wanted to remain this unbiased, which is hilarious. He's a right, Englishman, etc. And very... And people could critique him, but, I, but listen to this about him. He spent so many years poring over the manuscripts of the Masnavi, so he could translate it, years of his life. And, and you know, those old manuscripts, it's so hard to see the letters, and it's all falling apart. And he did that until he literally lost his eyesight. He gave his eyes so we could have room in and Coleman Barks doesn't speak Persian, so he takes those academic ones and then he puts his pen. So, of course, there are critiques, and that's valid. But also, they've made it easier for us. Mm -hmm. They've given us an opening if we'll take the baton and see those gaps and really show, like, Islam, this is Islam. Mm -hmm. This is the depth, the spiritual beauty of our tradition. And, um, inshallah, you know, we can help serve in that in that way and really yeah. show people that Rumi isn't just some anomaly, that he is one of the great fruits of the tree. Mm -hmm. But that, you know. No. If this is like, my name is Emma Van Tente for beautiful poems, but this is a bit like political. Yes. So I'm from Yemen and Mashallah. the way we, not, okay, not we, we this, this, me just say my family, uh, we view like Sufism as like, you know, and room and all of that. Basically, the essence of Islam is universal universality to like all human beings, all times, yes. all spaces. So, in like, whether that's Wahhabi Muslims or just Sunni Muslims mm -hmm. in general, and this is me making a generalization, us like excluding Sufism and mm -hmm. the mystical, beautiful, spiritual part of Islam. Yes. Like, aren't we going against the essence of what Islam is? And, like, just how do we find balance? And I don't know exactly what I'm asking, mm -hmm. but, yeah. Does it make sense? I mean, I hear, I, hear, um, I hear what you're getting at. And we have, we live in a time where Sufism is contested from two sides, really. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole lot of history. I actually have a podcast and I, with uh, one of the recent episodes called Sufism Contested. We talk about this. Because within the West, historically, they've associated everything they like with Sufism, everything they dislike, oh, that's Islam. But Sufism, <laughs> right? but, but within the Muslim world in the last few hundred years, because there's been these reform movements, you mentioned Ibn Abdul Wahhab and the Salafi movement, um, they start to say that Sufism is not a, 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 an, a, a you know, true part of Islam, which is, 
it's a bid'ah to say that because no one ever said that for 1,200 and some years in Islam. People critique certain aspects, certain practices of some Sufis, mm -hmm. like maybe certain. Uh, but the, the idea that Sufism itself wasn't an essence of Islam, no one in the history of Islam would have even understood that statement. Mm -hmm. Is including Ibn Taymiyyah. Like he would have been like, wait, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. and so this reform, but this reform movement did happen to take roots in places that have profound oil wealth, and so they were able to promote this narrative. And so, uh, you know, this that's a reality that's uh, very prominent. Anyway, it is a very charged conversation, and it's one that we want to give its due. But at the essence of it, how I've understood it, I think how most, let's just say, how most Muslims have understood it historically is that Islam has dimensionality, Islam, Iman, Ihsan, right? If you look at the Hadith of Jibril, that there's a sacred law, which is outward action, there's Iman, which is right understanding, and then there's Ihsan, which is the more how, how to worship God, is if you see him, and if you don't see him, know that he sees you. And that's, you know, different sciences develop to work on these. And Sufism is the kind of science that develops off, out of understanding how to worship God and if you see Him. But it's not a sect, it's not a historic thing. No. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, uh, I wasn't here at the beginning, but um, really, like, I'm honored to be here. Um, I, on the same topic, yes. uh, I've been witness to a very great uh, like shape, actually. like I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but like, really like speaking highly of you and um, like honoring you to the extent that saying that like, you know you should be sitting up teaching instead of him and I just wanted you to give us kind of like a concrete example of how this like like this concept of Sufism in a relationship with like a sheikh like manifest to those of us who may not be familiar um, like give me give us a concrete if you will example of how you can see these people who have like no egos or something of that, um, mm -hmm. so we can kind of like understand what that means. Because for all, for many of us, it's ephemeral, mm -hmm. um, uh, and it's, and like you said, you know, you can't really like describe how hard it is, but um, maybe maybe a little bit of that. And, yeah, and that's a really profound question, and and I think and I think there's kind of a broader, if I if I may, uh, broaden it out just a little bit. Is to say, I think that there's an interesting, we're in, we're in an interesting sort of moment. What I guess is this kind of modern dilemma. Yes. Is is the is the dilemma of of mentorship and guidance. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that's a that's a that I think the dilemma of that's a broad dilemma. Mm -hmm. You come to a place like Yale, and everyone's talking about mentorship. Mm. <laughs> um, my friend Kellen and I talk about that all the time. <laughs> who's mentoring? And Who's you know who's kind of it, it, you know giving you manna to kind of feed on and so on. And it's inter it's interesting that I think when it comes to religion or spirituality or the sacred, it, the the modern sensibility. And I consider myself a modern as much as mm -hmm, person. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden has an allergic reaction to guidance and mentorship and, and religious leadership. Uh, maybe that because religious leadership has been so piss poor. Um, <laughs> For so long, mm -hmm. so I think I think the question takes on an added importance. The way I'm hearing it is because I think there's 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 something really interesting about the notion of of guidance mm -hmm. and religious guidance and your own experience with I guess as the question is saying in terms of being with individuals, women or men, who um, provide kind of a framework. And guidance and mentorship in order to deal with the complexity of our modern lives. And your experience of that, yeah, taking so into account that background, that that, so that, 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 that that paradox. Yeah. yeah, I think all of us at the end of the day, they were telling us that it, it was here, right? So you were telling us, uh, Imam Omar, that they had a, what was it, the the good life, or what was the class on? <laughs> class on happiness. The class on happiness and the good life. That's so beautiful, because at the end of the day, that should be the main question we're asking, like, how to live what? How to live the best life we can. <coughs> and 
if you grow up in a traditional society, usually you, there's a kind of dominant religion in the region, which kind of gives you a framework for that. But we live in the modern world, and especially if you the, the better the school, the more intellectually elite, the more those frameworks are off. Like if you go kind of the South or the Midwest, you still find those frameworks pretty intact. But you go to the elite universities, the more elite it gets, the more like those frameworks are gone. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a very secular Northwest, you know, the least re religion, religious, you know, church going region of, of America. So I understand that very well. And You know, but the, the, there's still these questions, and, and I think the beautiful, the, one of the really important aspects of, to, to get to your, your question, is that people think about Sufism as maybe this poetry, maybe this, you think of certain chanting or dances, or maybe you think of certain metaphysical philosophers, and those are all um, maybe branches of the tree, but they're not the root. The root has always been Ilmanas, psychology actually, understanding the human side, understanding ourselves, and in in interest of living the good life, because seeing that, you know, how can I be the most generous version of myself, mm -hmm. the most kind, the mm -hmm. most honest, the, the one with the most integrity, the one with the least amount of self-centeredness and egotism, things that are universal that we all, and it's really a science of understanding the signs and symptoms of those kind of diseases of the heart and how to purify them and transform them. And that's why traditionally it has been within a, a kind of mentor-disciple role because it, you kind of need someone who's gone through that journey, had gone to the top of the mountain that can help you, take you by the hand to go up that mountain. I think I'm in the wrong road, sorry. That's okay. No problem. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think those are some of the things. And I think other peoples, by the way, have done a better job. I think the Buddhists have done a really good job at putting their tradition, some of the insights and wisdoms of their tradition, into the popular discussion in a way that doesn't say everyone has to be Buddhist or whatever, but let's just talk about this great insights from our tradition. And I think we could do a better job with that, those of that, us that are Muslim. Mm -hmm. But um, is there a moment that you can think about in terms of your own engagement with your own spiritual teachers and mentors? Yeah. Is there a moment that, that, that comes to mind in terms of almost like that penny drop moment mm -hmm. where, where that kind of relationship, that kind of mentorship entirely made sense? And that almost the stories of the past of, of sheikhs and saints and sayyidas and sayyids all of a sudden said, oh, now I understand what it must have meant for so-and-so to have been, you know, a disciple or a companion of so-and-so. That was a very personal question. Yeah, no. Uh, I think that's what the question was getting there's at. First two, there's <laughs> two stories that come to mind, and they both have to do with, uh, with uh, one of my teachers from West Africa, uh, Sheikh Mohammed Jilani, who's a great Sufi teacher. And these stories are very... So one of them, he's... The first one, I'll tell the first one, was I was walking down the street in West Africa, in the Gambia, and uh, obviously I stick out a little bit in West Africa. Right? <laughs> what is this Viking doing here? Right? <laughs> but, so people would just walk up to me. And I was wearing, some days I would go in like traditional African dress, and I'm like, hey, I'm one of you guys, but that didn't fool them at all. <laughs> so, but they'd be super interested in me, and then they would talk to me, and then they'd be like, Muslim? American? Allah Akbar! They'd be so excited and happy and all these things. Anyway, one time it was dark, and I was walking, and this, this man came up to me, and I could tell he was kind of a, kind of a rough fellow, like a street, young guy, but kind of like a street guy, you know? I've been around enough street guys to like, okay, this, what's going on? And he comes up to me and he's like, where are you from? What's going on? And he said, basically he started to, he found out I was Muslim. 
he started to recite Quran to me in the most beautiful voice. But he was this close to my face, and his breath smelled of alcohol. And it was this really surreal moment. Like, I was like, wow, this is, I'm not even sure I'm just going to witness this right now. <laughs> and so then he stops and, and he says, what are you doing here? And I told him, I was a guest of Sheikh Muhammad Jilani. I came to visit him. He said, Sheikh Muhammad, he takes care of all of us on the street. He feeds us all. He gives us. And in that moment, this teacher, no one knows that. There's all these people from all over the world that are visiting him, but they don't know that he would never tell anyone. It's a secret between him, but he takes care of all these, these kind of young brothers in the street that are kind of caught up in the life. And he doesn't say, you have to stop drinking. You have to. He just says, like, he just loves them. And another story about him that's really beautiful is, <laughs> well, you, you kind of know the individual, so I'll tell you, we have a mutual acquaintance who is a real character named Wasim. And from, the, from the UK and this he's a real hilarious dude but he goes to this retreat in Spain and he find there there was a group of people that were uh, reciting Quran every day and they're all reciting and so we seem saw that there there was a, an African man in the corner of the mosque this was in Spain that that wasn't joining so he said oh maybe he'd like to join he said hey brother would you like to join our, our gathering Etc. And he said, no, no, I'm fine. He said, please, we're literally crying. I insist you come. And so then he comes, and they're all reciting. And Wasim was like, I'm going to help this African brother. So he's like trying to help him recite properly. He's like, what up, Dali, Dali, Ami. Like he's like helping him recite Quran. So then he's saying, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so then a few days later, the retreat proper actually starts. And so one of the great American Muslim scholars, Dr. Omar, uh, Farouk Abdullah shows up and everyone is excited and Dr. Omar leads the prayer when he first arrives and then afterwards he turns and he says he says oh uh, my master will you lead us in prayer uh, a, a, a dua a supplication and Wasim thinks he's talking to him because he's looking at him so he's like oh me okay <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden he, he, he sees next to him is that, that African brother and he starts making a prayer in Arabic in really good Arabic and he's like wow his Arabic got better since the last time. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that he sees Dr. Omar this like 70 year old kind of sagely man come and kiss his hand this African man and then he realized that is the sheikh of his sheikh that is Sheikh Muhammad and he had been trying to teach him how to recite Quran, but he didn't do any. He didn't stop him. He didn't. He just said, "Okay, let, I'll practice with you. Help me learn." So this type of quality, this type of character, you know, uh, those people still exist who have that type of humility, that type of character, and that type of love. Um, even our uh, there's a Turkish scholar. I just thought of this. I was in Maryland. There's a Turkish center. I prayed the morning prayer there. And there was a group of Turkish students with a Turkish uh, sheikh that was there. And I was like, oh, I've heard about this Turkish sheikh. I said, I'm going to see if they're learning teaching in English so I can stay and I'll listen. But I wasn't sure if they were going to speak in Turkish or English because I was the only American. They're all Turks. And he started teaching in English. <coughs> so I was like, oh, cool, I'll stay. So I stayed about a half hour. And then I had a program to get to. So I just kind of quietly excused myself to leave after a half hour. And as I got to the end of the mosque, I just picked up that he was no longer speaking English. Mm -hmm. He was speaking Turkish now. Mm -hmm. And that he was going to teach the class in Turkish to all these Turks. But because in the corner of the mosque there was someone who didn't speak Turkish, he taught the whole group in English. And he didn't say anything, but when I left, he just switched back to their native tongue. And that, those type of things... Those are people who have such a high level of selflessness and self-awareness that, you know, we, we find it hard to believe sometimes. Mm. So, um, so you talk, first of all, thank you so much for being here the last couple of days. It's been it's some of the best, um, most insightful things I've learned here. Um, so I wanted to, like, ask about this sort of um, balance between, like, the physical and the um, and like the physical actions, I guess, that we do every day, and um, that kind of 
intuition that you have about something deeper inside of us that links us to something, you know, um, to each other and, and uh, brings us closer to Las Pantas. So, like, I wanted to ask you were, the the line about um, patience coming when you lose everything mm. physical sort of stuck with me. And then you talked about that one uh, was it Rabia uh, the the saint um, who was talking about um, there's nothing in this in this world that isn't already in here with me. Um, but then you also talked about the theophany of like um, everything around us possibly being like a divine, divine like uh, unfolding of like a manifestation of something else. Mm -hmm. And then you talked about a thousand ways to frustrate. And like I wanted to ask what you see as the balance between like the physical actions that we do, the prostrations, the like smile, the uh, acts of prayer, um, and like that link inside of us. Um, and I guess the the, the balance that you see between those, because sometimes I feel like um, those maybe can clash or like mm -hmm. um, or have some different ideas about how to um, reach that deeper um, mountain inside of us. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. I mean, that's uh, that's a profound question. <coughs> And I don't really know how to answer it adequately. But the first thing that comes to mind is that the beautiful saying of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which is so, so mystical. In which he says, he actually has a, a hadith putsi where he's actually speaking in the divine first person. He says, my servant draws near to me by the actions that I have made obligatory, praying and fasting, and continues to draw near by the extra acts of devotion until I love him or her. And when I love him or her, I become the eye with which he sees, the ear with which he hears, the hand with which he grasps, the foot with which she walks. And this is a profoundly mystical statement. What does that even mean? It's, I don't even know how to start to unfold it. But the essence of it is that the actual rituals, the practice is supposed to do something. It's a, it's a transformative, it's, it's, a, it's a science in a sense. Just like a science in the laboratory is your soul. It's, it's falsifiable, it's replicable. You can do the experiment yourself. You don't just trust your teacher or, his, or your, their opinion, but you actually do it within yourself and you should find the desired results of transformation. And I think, unfortunately, in our time, many people of different religious faiths have lost that concept of that it's a transformative journey and it's just something you are. Yeah, I'm Muslim, I'm Christian, I'm Buddhist, you know? And I'm not personally interested in that level of religion. I'm interested in the method. That this is a method of transformation. Um, and uh, I hope that answers your question. We're coming up to about, about 5.30. Um, I know that some folks still have to say their uh, evening prayers. Um, so uh, we, uh, we technically are in no rush. So uh, what, I, what I'd like to do is, 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 is formally for uh, us to wrap up, but everyone's welcome to stay as long as they want. I think, has the snow started outside? Yeah. Yeah, yeah? okay, it's already coming down. So it's nice and warm in here, and <laughs> we are welcome to stay at, at Dwight Hall. Um, I'd, like you to, I'd like you to kind of conclude us with, with a piece of poetry. Um, and before that, I mean, I, I think it's really interesting that the, the, the questions in the room. You know, I, I, I think what your poetry does, and what poetry does, is turn the mirror on ourselves very quickly. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think as we're hearing what you're saying, immediately it's this kind of, oof, I feel like the mirror turns and you're, you're looking at yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe that's what you were talking about, that, that that poetry kind of gets over all the barricades and mm. crosses all the trenches because it gets into us and we're like considering our mm. relationship. And there's something reflexive about poetry, isn't mm. it? Because immediately you're trying to situate yourself in relation to the words, which is sort of different than, mm. than, than, than fiction, that's mm. different than prose. That's, mm. it, it, there's, some, there's something quite special about this poetic experience. And I think the fact that poetry has always been an incredibly social vehicle, mm -hmm. but yet also intensely personal. We're all hearing the words, but each and every one of us in the room is going to interpret it differently, respond to it differently, 
accept or reject what's being said in a way, but, but nevertheless an internal conversation has started. And mm -hmm. I think that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe the, maybe the whole idea of a modern Rumi is, is for, uh, for us to have a far more active and deeper conversation mm -hmm. with ourselves on questions of, of meaning and, and, uh, and, and purpose. Um, but I also kind of think to myself, and this is an open-ended, it's not even a question, mm -hmm. we can talk about this later, is that I do struggle with the way in which the way in which our poetry engages also with our desire to see a better world. And we know that the building blocks of better societies and better politics and better economics as human beings, mm -hmm. us as human beings who engage with that that world. And yet, you know, I, I, I think about, and we were talking about this earlier today, I think about sort of early hip-hop culture or the poetry of the last poets and the early black arts movement. And, and there was almost a moment in, Amer in contemporary American history where po it felt like poetry was almost moving the needle and inspiring an entire generation to become active in the world. And I wonder to what extent that kind of poetry can be spiritual. And I, and I, you don't, I, it doesn't, I don't have to answer if you don't no, want to. It's a great. But I, but I, I do see that kind of. I mean, can our can can, it, can the language of spiritual poetry give to us not only as souls as individuals who require healing, but can that become a source of understanding and transforming the world to make it more just and more merciful and more compassionate. And does the kind of love that you have spoken about mm -hmm. today, how do we extend that love to, quote unquote, our enemies? Does loving the universe, including loving, lo uh, include us loving the white supremacist? Or, yeah. And I, and, I, and I don't know, I, I, I don't want to answer that necessarily. Mm -hmm. I just want to put it out there, and I know you think about these things, mm -hmm. so I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not talking something new. Mm -hmm. But, but, but I think those are some of the, some of the really profound dilemmas of the now, mm -hmm. um, which of course are, uh, uh, we can only express after having heard your poems and feeling a sense of opening. So, thank you for, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll, I'll turn it over to you to, to finish us off, and then we can move into more informal conversation. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I guess we'll do this. We'll close with a prayer. So after every line, just say, I mean. May your day be filled with love and light. May your wrongs be right. May your songs be tight. May your words give sight. May your newer shine bright. May you always be on the righteous side of the fight. May your lovers be loyal. May your soil be fertile. May your khaki stay creased. May your locks stay oiled. May your plans never get foiled. Amen. May your plot thicken. Amen. May your chicken be halal. Amen. May your style be sufficient. Amen. May your soul be free of its prison. Amen. May Allah increase you in your vision. Amen. May you find everything you've been missing. Amen. May you awake for prayer before the sun has risen. Amen. When you speak, may your audience listen. Amen. May you never feel trapped in the system. Amen. May you sire many righteous children Amen. who will act on prophetic tradition. Amen. May you always have food on your plate. May you learn from every mistake. Amen. May you rise above all the hate. Amen. And may Allah increase you in your state. Amen. May you never pretend that you are what you ain't. Amen. May your friends be real and never be fake. Amen. May your rent never have to be late. Amen. And may your health always be great. Amen. May Allah forgive every sin. Amen. Now and forever if you falter again. Amen. And may you always stay close with your kin. Amen. And may he make all your enemies friends. Amen. May he make reality of your plans. May your present be pleasant. May you have a good end. Amen. May your heart be purified of its flaws. Amen. And may you act according to the laws Amen. that were revealed in the book of Allah. Amen. And may he catch you whenever you fall. Amen. May the one guide you to the truth. Amen. When you doubt, may he show you the proof. Amen. May you be like the Ahala Suf Amen. with the wisdom of the elders, the energy of the youth. Amen. May he accept your prayers and your fasts. Amen. The very first all the way to the last. Amen. And remove obstacles that you have. May you receive everything that you ask. Amen. May you never have regret for your past. Amen. 
and receive mercy, not the wrath. Amen. And as you travel down your personal path, Amen. may you always have a reason to laugh. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Dr.